Welcome to Cross Platform Podcast, where we discuss how to solve productivity problems across platforms. I'm Augusto Pinot. And I'm Mark Elwix. And I'm very thrilled about this topic today, <laughs> even that Art has told me already stop going. Okay, today we're talking about tablets. Well, specifically, specifically traveling with tablets. Traveling with tablets, because, you know, as everybody knows, you're Mr. Tablet. Um, but what people may not know is I just got back from a an international trip 10 days in South Korea. And one of the requirements I had for taking this trip is I had I took an absolute minimum of technology with me. I did not take a laptop. I did not take a lot of the gear that I would normally take on a domestic trip or even a, a weekend trip. I had, because it's such a long flight and so much to do, I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this. So all I took was my tablet and my phone and a, and accompanying accessories for, you know, keyboard and charging cables and things like that. But those were the two primary devices. And traveling with a tablet, the question was, for that 10-day period, since it wasn't a work trip, I wasn't doing, you know, truly work, but could I use that tablet for everything personally as well as the occasional professional things that I would need to do. And <laughs> I have thoughts. <laughs> I have so, thoughts. And, and before your thoughts, I'm going to go into my mm -hmm. history with the tablets because my history with the tablets start way earlier than yours, start around 2011 or 10, really, when the first iPad came out. Okay, mm -hmm. when the first iPad came out, I was traveling heavily. And because of a lot of my travels were to Latin America because of work, I, you know, I could not, technology was not what it is today. It was not easy to replace as it is today. Um, you know, you can go, I can go or you can go you know, as you were in Korea, it may not be price appropriate. That's irrelevant. You could go mm -hmm. and buy a Samsung tablet over there and be up and running in an hour. Okay. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Yeah. That was not possible. <laughs> no, that's true. Your computer died. Okay. You were in trouble. So, because of that, I carry with uh, what I used to call uh, with a lot of affection, like the dead body. And the dead body, okay, was a, a bag who carried two laptops, a scanner, a printer, you know, and a bunch mm -hmm. of stuff. So I could be fully functional. I was traveling at the time around 140,000 miles a year. So I never touched the office. And my, I was in the office maybe two, three days of the month, if that. Mm -hmm. So because of that, I needed to be able to work anywhere. I carried cables to connect those laptops to the TVs in, in the room so I could have multiple screens when I get at night and all that. When mm -hmm. the iPad was announced, okay, I saw so many possibilities. And I bought one. I launched day, I bought my first iPad. And it was a slow. Yes, it was a slow. But that didn't replace my one of my laptops that first day. Because during the day, during the night, I needed, at the beginning, a different set of needs. But during the day, most of what I did was presentations, email, and those kind of things. Things that the iPad, as it came originally, was perfect for. And eventually, that iPad, that, that second laptop was replaced by another iPad and I travel with two iPads for a really long time. And then, you know, today on 2012, I co-wrote that book called iPad Only, was the first book uh, who came talking about making the iPad your main machine. And the iPad has been my main machine since 2011. I have passed through many of them. Actually, recently I was saying I have one here in my office that is a very, very old iPad. And it's a 10 year old iPad and I use it for one particular uh, part of the personal productivity club. We have a thing called the co-working space where we join a group of people join and we share screens, you know, that came on the pandemic days where everybody was feeling lonely at home and we keep it going and it's still going. We connect and we can see each other working. And 
And I use it for that. And the other day, it started failing. I was like, I'm, I don't know if I am ready to let this iPad go. <laughs> but the reality is I live on tablets. That's my main mm -hmm. machine. My I live on an iPad. And even now that my Vision Pro is replacing some of those iPad capabilities, you cannot be having that many apps and screens open at the same time it is very comfortable to work my i still my main bag is not the bag with the vision pro because that's not the bag where i can work anywhere it's a bag with an ipad and, and a keyboard it's an ipad mini that's what i carry with me everywhere and if apple i have said that if apple allow me to synchronize my watch with my phone, I may even get rid of the phone. The phone is something that I use. I will I use the phone more for coaching than what mm -hmm. I use for me. Even the phones for my company comes through Google Voice and they work on the iPad. So so I'm very familiar with this. I'm very so, familiar with going with the iPad. Let's be let's be clear about something though. The challenge for me with tablets has always been the fact that Android tablets were never up to snuff. I've been using them back since before the old Nexus 7. Matter of fact, I still got my Nexus 7 in a drawer around here. I've got a you know a couple of Android or Amazon Fire tablets sitting around here. A lot of tablets, but never have been up to snuff because one, Android hasn't right. been up to snuff. Two, the hardware itself hasn't been at a level where you could really say, okay, this, this could step up Samsung. When they got to about the six S tablets, uh, they started to say, okay, you know, this, this might be a viable option. And Android started catching up with that. What made this possible for me is the tablet that I use currently is a uh, galaxy S eight, which is, <clears throat> I think nearly the perfect merger a form factor display and power um, as well as cost. Because the last thing you want to do is take take a tablet that's like an $1,800 tablet somewhere um, and have this big sheet of glass crack as soon as you're doing something with it or, or it takes some abuse. So you have to have that balance when you're taking a traveling. So that was one of the, the core requirements I had of this. And I think the technology has gotten to that point on the Android side where you could do tablet only or tablet mm -hmm. majority. I don't, I still don't know that it's tablet only, but tablet majority. Now I will say the other piece of it though, that makes, makes it viable is Samsung Dex because Dex gives you a desktop type environment. But before I go into that route, let's talk about the, the travel itself, just, you know, getting, from here to there with the technology you leave. So anyone who's flown recently knows that if you take a laptop on an airplane, the odds are extremely good. You're going to have to take it out and show that it's a laptop. And in many cases, turn it on. Well, tablets, you don't have to do that. Tablets, you can take it out. You can put it in the bag where they do their little x-ray scan. They're fine with it. So that's a big convenience factor. No question in my mind that is it is a convenience factor. Second, that do battery. not apply. That do not apply when you travel with multiple tablets and multiple. Tablets. Well, no, and that's that is something I I do want to get into is the technology issues that I encountered traveling actually had nothing to do with the tablet. They had everything to do with everything else that went with it. The problems came in with batteries and cables and and all that right. ancillary stuff. But the tablet itself did an excellent job. Now the flight that I was on was a 15 hour flight. So there's no device, laptop, tablet, doesn't matter, that is going to run for that full time off of its battery. So you know you're going to be running off of a charging system. This is where having a tablet with USB-C was so useful because the tablet was USB-C, my earbuds were USB-C, my headphones were USB-C, my phone's USB-C. We've talked about this before. That means that there's one charger, one cable, one battery unit. Simplified down. That trip raised an interesting problem, though, because the flight 
offered, and if you're watching, I'm doing air quotes, Wi-Fi. They had Wi-Fi on the plane to, I think, about 500, 500 megabits of download before they jacked mm -hmm. it off of what you were available to have. And the cost was like $70 for the flight. Oh, wow. And it was just, it was insane. It was absolutely insane. Now, granted, I understand you are flying basically over the North Pole or pretty darn close to it and coming down the other side. Yeah, so 70 bucks? There isn't a lot of lot of places where you're going to have signal for that so that became another requirement in the pre-trip planning what was i going to be able to do on the tablet what applications required connectivity to even start up much less do anything with it and that was that takes me to my first point for anyone planning to travel with a tablet put the apps on there that you want to use then put it in airplane mode and see what still works. See what doesn't work. See what gets hung up. See what won't even open because there's a lot of things that require an authentication. That's a really important thing because the last thing you want to do is get onto that flight and then realize I can't use half of the things I wanted to use. <laughs> so that that pre-travel testing, that that toggle to a no connectivity state was really important for me. I knew that I wasn't going to actually, do work. Actually, I'm going to, to interrupt you there because mm -hmm. that's a test yeah. that I recommend to people even in local trips. Yes. When, unless you know you go to a place where Wi-Fi data will never mm -hmm. be an issue, that's a test that you need to do because we have we have been in places where you get there and you thought, oh well, we will be able. You know, recently we went to a trip. Um, for the weekend, it wasn't a big deal. And we took the, the Apple TV to connect to the hotel TV for the kids. Okay. Mm -hmm. And when we got there, the the internet was having issues. So they were having the hotel was having issues and there was no internet. So the only movies that the kids were able to see were the ones that we download for the for the way that were on mm -hmm. their devices. But as I you know, when, when we were doing the plan, I told them a couple of movies each, and they were like, eh, you know, typical kids. And I, at the, at the, in the, on the location, they were like, oh, well, it's good that you make us download the movie, you know, because, well, parents, once in a while, know something. <laughs> Occasionally, we get it right. <laughs> so, Occasionally. going with, going with that step, and it, and it is, you're right, testing that here as well for just regular operations is just as important because there's a lot of apps nowadays that don't use local copies of your data. Mm -hmm. They're literally just an app that provides a shell to a website and runs the information back and forth that way. And it, and it flat out won't work. So that's, that was an active consideration. I knew I wasn't going to be doing much work on the flight or actually keyboarding or taking notes or anything. So it was going to be all consumption. So for me, again, as you were saying, downloading time, applications like Netflix. For me, the big thing is I downloaded stuff from YouTube. I used the YouTube cache and I downloaded playlists of stuff. And I created a playlist in advance of YouTube videos that I wanted to watch. And then I downloaded those. I pulled down Audible audiobooks, um, the flight over. That's actually what I did is I just listened to an audiobook on the way over. Uh, but one of the advantages in the tablet, at least the tablet model that I have, is it has a micro SD card. So I could load a lot of video, a lot mm -hmm. of audio, did not have to worry about consuming that space. Many of the newer tablets don't have that expansion capability. You are stuck with the amount of RAM that you have in there. So you have to have that as a consideration. You know, right. can you can you put stuff in there? Can you, you know, not how is it going to store and how are you going to manipulate that? So that being said, the travel over, not a problem. Using the device there came in handy multiple times. And this is where it wasn't a work thing. I had taken it with me to in case I had to do some work, but I didn't have to, luckily. Um, but I did use it primarily for two things. One was photo editing because I took close to 800 photos while I was there. 
and being able to go through and pull the photos over to the tablet and edit them with the stylus and do the retouching. And that was just incredibly useful. I could have done it on my phone, sure. But why? I have the larger display. It has the flexibility. It has the functionality. And this is where when we've talked about in the past about being in ecosystems, the ecosystem really pays off. Because within the Samsung ecosystem, I can quick share photos from my phone to the tablet directly. Piece of cake, just pass them right over. I don't have to load them to the cloud and then pull them back down. I can just do that pass through and it works nice. The other thing I used it for was journaling. And this is something we're going to talk about next week as we, as we delve into this idea of digital journaling. Um, I have gotten very heavily in about for about the past month now back into digital journaling and, and literally like it's my own closed social media bubble where I will do little posts to myself about what's going on, where my thoughts are, what, you know, what things are rattling around in my head in any given time, just to get them out of my head. Because the application I use syncs between the two devices, my phone and my tablet, it then became very easy to rapidly capture something on my phone, then later on go back to my tablet and expand on it and explore it in more detail. So both of those work great. So tablet, travel over, travel back, getting through security and all, I would definitely say absolutely do that. Um, we've talked about this in the past. One rule, do not, do not put your tablet in the little pouch in the seat in front of you. <laughs> Don't do that. It will, you will forget it. It will disappear. And you will cry. Yes. Now, I, I actually had a had a client happen exactly that. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> client was flying uh, from Singapore mm -hmm. uh, to the Netherlands and got in the plane. And when it landed home, couldn't find it, couldn't find it, couldn't find the tablet. So, you know, try, try to track the Samsung, find, call the airline, find that it was left on the plane. And the client didn't even remember pulling the tablet out of that. And after many thought what the conclusion was exactly that, that in a moment you pulled the tablet to do something quick and got distracted, put it there. That was it. Recover it on the next trip to <laughs> to, to Singapore because happened for Dom Log that is a place this client do often. But mm -hmm. if you get into a place where, you know, like what you're saying, Korea, where you're not, you know, it's not your often trip. Now, the only thing you can do is forget about it because the airline will not ship it. No. Uh, we actually ran into a problem on the flight over. Somehow during, during the flight, my wife lost her AirPods on the plane. And because there was no Wi-Fi on the plane and they weren't activated, when you try to do a find my AirPods, it kept saying they were still in Newark, New Jersey, because it had never updated their location. Right. So they basically disappeared and we had to replace those. Um, technology with or for traveling, though, I had mentioned in the previous episode, one of the things that I did get were the new Samsung tags that they have for luggage and locating things. Very similar to the mm -hmm. Tile ones, but they're newer versions. Those things worked extremely well. Very well. I put one in each of our big suitcases that were checked. I had one in my backpack. I had one. I have one on my keychain all the time. And it is very, very reliable for determining where things are location. It does require that it pass in per, or proximity to another Samsung phone so that you can see it. Uh, but that really wasn't a challenge where we were. And if right. you're using Apple, well, they're, they're every place. So that's also not a hard thing. So I do recommend doing that. It was very reassuring to be sitting on the plane and check your phone before you take off and see that your luggage is actually under. It's with you. Right. <laughs> so, and it's not still sitting in the terminal or, or on its way somewhere else. So that, that was very reassuring. 
Um, here's the challenge that some people may get into. And this is one of the things I noticed when going through uh, security it was related to battery packs. There is oh, a yeah. cap. And we, and we had talked about this in, in pre-show and I had misspoken about something. It's not about the, the hours. It's about the, the watt hours. Uh, TSA caps it at 100 watt hours on the device, which most things that's, that's fairly small. I mean, your batteries are, are fairly realistic with that. Uh, matter of fact, I saw an article today where uh, Jackery is now offering a 99 watt hour, basically little lunch box that you can take that'll recharge dozens of things. And supposedly you can get it through TSA. Here's the thing with batteries. though: Batteries cannot be not go in your checked luggage. If you're mm -hmm. if you're traveling, they cannot go in the luggage that's going under the plane. They must go in the bag that's going with you on the plane. It's just the requirement. So we ran into a small problem where my wife was shuffling things around and accidentally grabbed a little battery that she had and it got mixed in with her stuff that got stuck in one of the checked bags. Got stopped by Korean security. The bag got checked. I got pulled off to the side. What is this? And I'm going, I don't have a battery in there. And finally we go through and I'm like, they're showing me on the x-ray and I'm like, I don't know what that is. Let's see what that is. And couldn't finally found it. Little battery. Just just a little 500 mil or 5,000 uh, milliamp battery. Nope, can't can't do it. Okay. What I found was the challenge with security was my tech bag confused them because I had a, <laughs> I had a shoulder bag that had all my tech in it. So it had in it my tablet, my batteries because I had two battery packs. It had a charger. It had about four charging cables of different types. Uh, had a stylus, had a metal jo uh, pen or Parker Jotter pen, had a notebook that has steel zipper on it. You put all that stuff in one bag. All you're they missing is the little the little alarm clock, so that they know that it's going to go off at some point. I, they completely freaked over it. I mean, we had to strip everything out of the bag. They took apart my one pen. I just, and I I really can't blame them for it i'd rather them be more cautious than anything else uh, but that's something i do recommend if you are doing any sort of traveling that is not short range traveling minimize the tech minimize the stuff make it simple uh there are a lot of bags that you can get that just open flat and just make it easier to to check and go through uh, but if you're taking a lot of tech with you be prepared they're gonna question they're going to question, they're going to look, they're going to poke, and they're going to want to know what it does and does it actually do that. Yeah, mine sadly gets checked more than what I care to admit. And and in part is mm -hmm. because what you said, I have cable connector, headphones, you know, I, I travel with more than one tablet, two keyboards, you know, that all that when they look at it never I I it's few the times that I have passed security without being asked. Yeah, it it was it was interesting. Now, here's an observation that I had while I was there in, in Korea. And we figured, you know, me going to Korea, I'm going to the world of Samsung. This is going to be, you know, Samsung. No, it's not really. <laughs> I mean, you have to kind of go out of your way to find a Samsung store. Um, the phones are probably equal with Apple's. Actually, maybe saw a few more Apple's than than actual Samsung's in the wild. Mm -hmm. A lot of older ones. Um, but looking at the tech and how it was being used there, I can now truly see a solid use case for foldable phones. Okay. Because, because a good foldable phone, like a, a Galaxy Fold 5, would have eliminated me having to take the tablet. I could have gone with just that device. Okay. And he, and here's why I say that, because that foldable the phone, if I open it up, that screen is it's not quite as large as the tablet screen, but it's getting in that but neighborhood. Right, right. So the only thing I would really need to take with me is a Bluetooth keyboard. Well, those are cheap and small and easy to pack. Yeah. So I could I could get away without the tablet. 
if I had the foldable phone to take with me. So I can see that use case has finally truly started to come to fruition. We've always had this mindset, you know, those of us who are, are PDA geeks about having the one pocket computer that does all things. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, technically I could have done that with my phone because if I had the HDMI cable to it and a Bluetooth keyboard, I could have hooked that up to just any TV with an HDMI and run decks off of it. And all of a sudden I have everything in one spot. So mm -hmm. while the tablet itself was incredibly useful and convenient, I don't know that it is that the use case is strong enough that it could not be supplanted by something else. I still well, think I mean, it, and even, position is a little bring, tenuous there. Let me bring the following to you because this is something that is happening in, in is developing as we speak. And I have two clients um, who are leaving laptops and tablets for mm -hmm. phones. And what they have discovered, both of them, is that it's not a phone. It's a dual phone. Is you carry two phones and a foldable keyboard. Okay. Because that gives you the flexibility to have the equivalent of what you do with a laptop and a phone, but everything mm -hmm. in your pocket. The dream of the PD, the your dream in the 90s that everything was going to fit on your pocket like the pump pilot with enough power, mm -hmm. exactly that. And they have basically one phone to work, one phone to be on it. Because what's happening in these particular cases is most of the thing is email, PowerPoint, and Teams. Mm -hmm. So they are working in this dual phone environment. Both of both of the clients right now we're working in to move them. One we're moving out of the tablet. One I'm moving out of the laptop. Yeah, I saw, I saw quite a few foldables in the wild while I was there. A lot of the mm -hmm. flips, which I which I expected. Those are the kind of the social media phones. But I did see a surprising, <laughs> excuse me, number of the of the Samsung folds, and they were being used. I guess almost to a person like a traditional phone for 95% of the things I saw them do. They were using it. They were kept it in the folded configuration and they were just using it. And if you fold a galaxy fold up, it's about the size of my phone. It's thicker, but dimensionally <clears throat> it's about the same. It has a stylus and it mm -hmm. does its things. So right. if you had the ability to have a larger display only when you needed it. And then you could, because the, the fold actually has two screens on it, I could really see, like I said, with the trip that we took, I could really see that that device could have replaced the tablet. Now, that said, there is the one problem with that equation, and that's you have a single point of failure. You break that thing, you lose that thing, you drop that thing, something terrible happens to it, you are done. Mm -hmm. You are done across the board. And uh, that's and that's the reason, that's exactly the reason these two cases I'm mentioning are coming with two phones. They're exactly mm -hmm. the same phone, exactly the same. And and actually it's funny because one of them, again, two cases in particular that I'm coaching right now, one, both are on the same network, and the other one on purpose, but in two different networks. That okay. I found that very interesting to say, I need to find if this is going to be my new tech moving forward, I need to make sure that I always connect it. And then he got different networks. So he, mm -hmm. one network, the, the chances that both networks will fail are slim to none. So that was the thinking behind. Yeah. And that's, that was one of the things that I was looking at before we traveled over was the option of connectivity, mobile connectivity. Um, the The common knowledge is when you get there, you buy a SIM card or an e, or you pay for an eSIM and you use that. Right. We have AT and T, or we have one of the major providers, AT and T, and we've had them forever, um, and they have an international plan that actually, from a cost perspective. For two phones on that doing it wasn't bad. So we figure, all right, worst case scenario, we can get a SIM while we're there if this doesn't work. We got there. It worked. 
it just worked. What I did notice, which was interesting, is that the coverage, at least compared to the area that I'm in, metropolitan Philadelphia area, um, the coverage is 4G primarily over there in most of the areas I was in. I kind of expected like 5G plus, you know, top end, high speed. No, nah, it's kind of like mid range. And the reason being that I that I can rationalize is that Wi-Fi is every place over there. You get on the bus. Mm. There's I wish I had taken a picture of it. I'm still kicking myself for not having to do that. Um, hanging over the door on the bus was a four antenna Wi-Fi router <laughs> with wow. a cellular receiver next to it. And I just had to check on like, yeah, you hit the, the QR code. There's your information. You're, good. you're, you're, you're off and running. So yes, public municipal Wi-Fi over there is a thing. It works. They count on it. Um, who was I talking to? I was talking to somebody over there about it and we don't have municipal Wi-Fi here because we've got commercial providers who, who kind of force right. that out. Um, I think it would be wonderful if we had municipal Wi-Fi around, but I don't see it that happening anytime soon. So long story short, can you travel with a tablet? Absolutely. Should you travel with a tablet? Absolutely. Would I feel the need to take my tablet if I was taking my laptop also? Yes. I would not abandon the tablet just because I was taking the laptop. It created... The experience that I had created a more unified segmentation. And that doesn't make mm -hmm. any sense, but let me explain it. I knew the job of my phone. I knew the job that the tablet was supposed to do. I didn't spend my time trying to make one do the job of the other. My phone's primary job was for messaging, for mapping, which just, if anybody cares... Um, in Korea, they don't use Google Maps. Google Maps doesn't work for squat. Well, it kind of sort of, it's, it's pretty terrible though. There's a service called Kakao, which is their primary messenger service and also their primary mapping service. There's also one called Naver. Uh, so you have to download and install those and half of it's in Korean. So I couldn't read it anyway. Uh, but that said, that was the phone's job. And as right. my camera, and I'll tell you, anybody who wants to try it, S23, S24, the camera, holy cow. Absolutely amazing. I really put it through its paces and I've been using the AI functionality on it to do things like object erase or when, you know, taking people out of pictures. Spectacular. Absolutely spectacular. That said, the tablet's job, the tablet did what its job was. I wasn't trying to make it a camera. I wasn't trying to make it a laptop. I gave it a specific set of jobs and that's what it did. So if you're planning on this or you have to plan on this or you're starting to look at, okay, I'm going to be doing more traveling, you know, summertime's coming up. I'm going to be traveling around. If you have a tablet, start to look at how do you outfit it to make sure that that is your primary device and eliminate some of the tech that you don't need to carry around. You know, I'm, and I advise this to people all the time. A star, if you are unsure, okay, take take the tablet. You know, and I, I my my wife, my wife was one, okay, um, who when when she got the tablet for work, she was like, I'm not sure I will carry it. If I'm anyways carry this, I will carry the laptop. So they carry both for the first travel, okay, and try to use the tablet. Okay, so you carry the laptop if you have never done it. Okay, carry both on the first trip and see if you can only leave on the tablet. You may not. Fine, then you you didn't suffer. You don't. You know, don't don't stress. Especially if you're not going local where you don't have you know the constraints that you were having. Take both a couple of times and see. You know, start working on the day to day on the tablet. You know, that was one thing that my wife start doing was okay let me close the laptop here in my desk you know in the mm -hmm. comf comf absolutely comfort of life okay in her office and let me see how much i can go with the tablet and to the point that exactly what happened is that and i have seen that experimented by many people 
that they discover, oh, I can now use this laptop a lot less. Not only that, for a lot of people, the tablet experience, the tablet experience is different. It's a more personal experience oh, than the laptop. by far. So for a lot of people, even work, it's now nicer knowing that I can do it, you know, in that device instead of on my laptop. Now, as a as a Windows guy, I do Windows support yeah. and just, you know, one of the things I had to be able to do was to be able to still provide that from a work standpoint. You know, I, I'm independent, so it's not really a vacation if somebody needs help. The safety valve was the fact that the remote support software that I use has an Android app. Mm -hmm. So when I left, I left my laptop set up where I could log into it from anywhere and run it as if I were sitting at it. That's the safety valve. Now it, it kind of crashes with that whole connectivity availability thing. But if connectivity is not an issue, then yeah, it's like you've got your laptop with you. Right. And you can do the same thing on an iPad. I mean, depending on the service provider you or the software you use, I use an application called Splashtop. Um, it works great. Creates, passes the screen through. I can do file transfers, control it with my mouse, keyboard, touchscreen. Works extremely well. That's the kind of tool that says, okay, this device that I have will do the job. Here, here's what I came into, though, with an interesting question. We're talking about taking a tablet. Would a Chromebook do the same thing? In theory, yeah. In theory. So my curiosity was, well, wait, could I do this with a Chromebook? And I realized I couldn't. It wouldn't work the same way because more stuff on a Chromebook is dependent on connectivity than it is on an Android or an iOS tablet. Oh. There, is, there is not as much stuff that runs locally on a Chromebook. Now, the Chromebook that I have, I got a new gaming Chromebook and it's just fantastic. It runs circles around most laptops I've ever seen. If it's got connectivity, the majority of the apps on it are basically just progressive web apps. Well, that means they got to have a web connection. So what can I do with it offline? Certain apps I could do something with. I could have like loaded the YouTube app and maybe downloaded stuff onto it. But again, most Chromebooks don't have the same level of storage available to them. <laughs> so I think in that case, even with the form factor, tablets win when it comes to getting as close to that all-in-one device. Still not perfect, but it's got a lot more potential use cases than just right. the, the big device. Now, granted, my Chromebook's huge. If I look at my, like the Lenovo 3 that I've got, which is the little Chromebook, it looks like a tablet, acts like a tablet. Matter of fact, it's about the same size as my tablet. The form factor argument goes away, but it doesn't change the connectivity conversation. And I think that's where, I think that's where Chromebooks will always struggle because they don't have that truly portable thing. Uh, and honestly, I think even now, tablets are friendlier. They are really more designed for the user mm -hmm. than for the functions. There are, there are more personal, there are more personal relationships. So, so the question now that you did this heavy test mm -hmm. is the next trip, local, far, doesn't matter how that how this because based on what you are being sharing i think this changed the next trip for you oh Even definitely if it's just a that, local one yeah that for th what i've done is i've changed a couple of things already uh, i have a smaller go bag for my tech it's a streamlined bag it fits the tablet it fits a single 10,000 milliamp battery which is enough to recharge my phone twice and the tablet once which is fine i don't need to do that anyway um 
The tablet itself has the keyboard cover on it, so it minimizes the amount of stuff that has to go with it. I take a charging cable that all fits in that little go bag, and I take my traveler's notebook, and that's it. It's a very streamlined package now, uh, where before I was always feeling like I didn't have enough tech with me. That was always a struggle. Well, now it's like, eh, no, I got plenty of tech. I can do everything I need to do with that combination. And again, if I were to move to a foldable phone, might even be able to eliminate some more of that. However, I think the real question comes in, has it changed me using the tablet on a daily basis? Because I was up until be the this, next yeah, up until this, I was I was doing the exercise of all right, how much could I do on the tablet? You know, can I do all my daily activities? And I have found by going through that exercise, and again, Samsung Samsung Dex gives you a, a Windows a windowed operating system. Um, I could probably use it for. 80 to 85 percent of yeah. everything i do without a problem uh, there are some apps <clears throat> this is an android thing there are some apps that still can't figure out how they should orient themselves you know you open facebook and it still shows up sideways uh, but dex takes takes care of that so you can get around some of those issues but could i use it for the majority of things can i use it for my email can i use it for notion can i use it for taking notes can i do it for the handwriting all of that functionality, absolutely. There's very little, yeah, there's very little that isn't a dedicated Windows application that is only available on Windows that I cannot provide the same functionality over on the Android side. So, so if I were to look at this and say, okay, if I were to upgrade, would it be worth getting a bigger one? And that, that's really the final travel question is what's the right size? I mean, Samsung has the eights, well, the, the nines now, the nine plus and the nine ultra. Well, the nine ultra, I believe is a 12.9 inch display. Um, I'm not sure. What's the largest iPad size? 12.9. So the largest see. one is 12.9. So, so that's, and, and that is a very interesting question because what you do in size, I think it's a question that evolved. And what I mean mm -hmm. by that is when you think, and, and this happened to a lot of my clients when we work about, you know, going iPad or going iPad to turn iPad your main machine, they go, well, I have a laptop 15, 16, 17, let me get the largest iPad that I can. Great. But do you really need that? Okay. And it's a very difficult question, um, to be honest with you. So um, I think, so here's the, the thing that occurs to me with it. You're not holding your laptop. Correct. That to me is the defining factor is can you hold it up? And it has to be in portrait mode. Landscape mode's fine, but it, it just feels wrong. Hold it in portrait mode and does it feel too big? And that's one of the challenges that I see with like the S9 Ultra, the, the largest iPad. It's a beefy thing to hold up. Yep. This S8 tablet that I have is comfortable. I can sit there comfortably in a chair. I can sit there at my dining room table. You know, I'm going to take it to a brewery in a, in a little bit and do some work. That type of thing it's again, it fits nicely. And that's where I challenge people to go back and say, well, you're right. Do you need the biggest thing? Do you need the beefiest? Well, probably not, at least not from a display standpoint. Well, and the second question is what, what are you going to hold with the iPad or the tablet in general? Are you going to do a lot of hand holding? Or, no, you know what? I'm going to use that one because it's lighter, portable, uh, you know, but I'm not going to be holding it in my hand. Hey, if you're not going to hold it in your hand, that's fine. But as you said, if you are planning to interact with the device, I advise not go above 11. 
And there is a rumor that Apple will release in May 7, I think it is the event. Uh, yeah, you've got a new and, mini coming. And I don't know if the mini is going to come. There is, I have I saw... rumors both ways. Yeah, I thought I saw rumors that a new mini was coming, but okay. Yeah. If the new mini coming, I will I will acquire. But uh, but that's for example, that's one thing that happened to me. Okay, I had my main machine right now is the mini. Okay, I guess do I have iPad more powerful than the mini? Yes, but it's exactly what you happen. I work on the mini. The mini has the phone is sometimes too small for me to do certain things for a very period mm -hmm. long period of time. Okay, I, even if I put the keyboard the mini has the perfect size so that is my main machine above the 11 inch and the 13 inch the mini is the machine that i like to use yeah i was just looking here out of curiosity the samsung tab 8 s8 which is the one i have is an 11 inch display the z fold 5 is a 7.6 inch display so you give up three inches but it also fits in your pocket. Correct. So the irony is, is that 7.6 inch display is very close to what we used to have on the Nexus. And that Nexus is to this day considered an almost perfect device from a form factor standpoint. It was just, it was a beautiful thing to hold and so comfortable and, and it was just laid out so nice. That ratio i think is really really telling on these things now this is also my s8 has a fairly chunky screen to body ratio it's an 83.6 um, so that means we've got a fair amount of bezel around it there's more that are coming that even have the smaller bezels personally and this is just a tablet observation personally i'm okay with some bezel around the edge of a tablet because i need something to hold on to I need at least a little bit of bezel mm -hmm. around there. A little bit. Yes, I agree. So looking at something like that, if you're if you're looking at a tablet for travel, I absolutely suggest you go to a place where you can hold it for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And I and I'm not talking 30 seconds. You need to be able to stand there for a good five minutes with it in your hand to know how much that weight is off balance, how much weight there is with it. Um, because remember, that's going to be what you're carrying around the whole time. And that little bit of weight actually adds up very quickly. That's all. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, but yeah, can can a tablet be your primary travel tool? I think absolutely. At least I, I, we knew it on the Apple side. I think this this journey has proven to me that it could be done on the Android side as well. well if I'm, you have I'm the I'm right honestly... tablet. I honestly think it happened similar as happened on the Apple side, you know, and we have been saying this, you know, we are, we are friends from the time where Apple and Android were different on the sense of performance and stuff that, that can be done. And now for many years, okay, that's not been the issue. Yeah, there are differences in Android operating system and the apps and Apple and the apps, but it's not really a performance issue anymore. But it mm -hmm. comes back for to understand that what you are changing has nothing to do with performance and everything to do with how you do certain things. You are not going to be able to do things in the same way you do it in your Mac or in your PC. Some of the things are different, but also some of the yep. things, hey, are nicer, okay, interact, touch the screen. It works differently. It's, even mm -hmm. if you have a touch screen, Chromebook or or Windows, it's not the same as the tablet experience. Yeah, definitely. Definitely taking the time to get comfortable with it. <laughs> and especially if you're going to ask ask your tablets to do more than just play YouTube videos, taking time to work with it and understand, understand the apps very well. Because also, and you see this on Apple, as, and Lord knows I see it on Android, mm -hmm. the phone version of an app and the tablet version of the app is different will may work completely differently sure. and if it works at all because in many cases especially on android there isn't a tablet version of the app it's just a right. giant phone version 
and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable and that's yeah it's just you're working yeah that happened on some old apps on the on the apple has done a great job there and allowing developers to expand transition even some some of them are exactly the same but it distributes better than mm -hmm. exactly what you're describing you know like you zoom in into that thing so. yep uh aside from that like i said tech tech and travel pretty straightforward as long as long as you plan um the only excuse me plugs plugs are a big thing we bought a bunch of those european convert european style converters yeah. they they work just fine no issue there you're charging blocks um i do recommend getting a if you can do like a fast charge on your phone or a super fast charge um something like a 65 watt charger that's fantastic, especially if it uses, you know, all of your devices can charge off of that. Um, if you have to take one or two cables, that's fine. But that that can go a huge, diff, huge way in not having to carry a whole bunch of extra batteries. If you can quick charge something, it's just as good. Um, yeah, aside from that, pretty straightforward. Oh, one last thing. So before I left, I recognized that my earbuds, I used the, the Samsung earbuds. Uh, um, the pros have a five hour battery life okay. in ear. Now the case has extra battery life and that's fine. But the problem would be that part way through the flight, I would have to take them out and charge them or I could wear one at a time. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose of the noise canceling earbuds. Matter of fact, it doesn't even turn on noise canceling. They're very good at noise canceling, but they wouldn't wait. So what I invested in was just a decent set of over-the-ear headphones with the big bar across the top. Mm -hmm. thing. Why? Because the set I got has an 80-hour charge in it. <laughs> and it has noise canceling in it. Now, it doesn't have to be the, the $400 Bose headphones. But if you get, you know, read the reviews, get a good a good set. These are a company called Earfun. Um that made all the difference in the world for me for the flight. Put it you know, on, it is, turn it on, noise canceling, off and running. You know, and I, and I mentioned this to you. I I have still the bows from those many. These are very very old. I don't even know mm -hmm. how old they are. Okay, I'm trying to find their Quiet Comfort 15. So let's see here, Quiet. Comfort 15. Oops. According to this, they were released around 2009. So this will be, they're at least 13 years old. Okay. And the reason okay. I keep them is exactly for what you said. I have replaced the, uh, the, the iPad and the top, but I got at some point from Amazon this, okay? And yeah. for the people who are listening or not seeing, it's basically a Bluetooth adapter for the boat. So you don't need mm -hmm. to have the cables. You don't need to feel like you're in the 90s, okay? But it is great because it gives you, it, they don't sound as good as, you know, obviously, you know, a more recent technology on audio, but the noise technology technology continue being good enough. So I keep them because of that. I'm, if they ever die, I will replace them with something. But for traveling and noise cancellation, nothing mm -hmm. beats this thing. And it's a AAA battery, so I can have another one and they last almost forever, to be honest with you. Yeah, this is these are the earphone Earfun Wave Pro Active Noise Canceling Headphones, yada yada yada. I'll put a link in the um in the notes in Personal Productivity Club. Uh, what I liked about these a lot: one, they're very collapsible; two, they have an excellent uh, noise canceling function, and they also have an ambient function, which I found very useful uh, because there are times where you'll have the noise canceling on, and then all of a sudden they come over the speakers and start to talk to you. And even then, it's a little hard to understand them. By just hitting one of the buttons, I could flip it into an ambient mode where the mics in the headphones helped and they added 
to the volume and the clarity, which was very nice. Uh, but these, at the end of the day, they're about sixty dollars. <laughs> and like yep. I said, they're an eighty. They're an eighty hour. Comes with a case and all. But this was a really worthwhile investment, even though I still took my earbuds with me to have them just running around on a daily basis and all. Uh, for that long extended flight, I found these over the year ones were much more comfortable. Uh, they were better isolating, and they're something that I would absolutely just hang on to um, for any traveling, you know, car trips or anything like that. So right. and looking in, looking into something like that and investing in something like that, I think is an absolutely worthwhile spend for that kind of a trip. Yep. Well, so. with this, we have come to the end of the show. So follow us where you like to listen to podcasts, like us, subscribe to us, and leave us a review. As always, you can interact with us in personalproductivity.club. Thank you very much to, um, his name is Gabriel me because I don't have it on my note, who asked us this week, where <laughs> were you guys? Okay, where are you guys? Sorry, I decided to go on vacation. And then it's, he decided that he did not want it to. What time will be on Korea right now? Oh, right now it would be about 4 a.m. You see, he so, was not willing to record at three in the morning Korea time. So I, I, I love you guys. No, 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 no. I, I love you guys, but trust me, you don't want to deal with four AM art. Okay, you, you don't want that. And matter, and just as a final anecdote, jet lag is a real thing. It, it had, it destroyed me going over and coming back. I've, I was just a train wreck with jet lag, but that's a whole different conversation. If you want to that know about my jet, my, my jet lag stories, reach out to me over on personal productivity club. I will happily tell you my jet lag stories and anything else about, uh, about my adventures in Korea that you'd like to know. So. Awesome. Well, um, we are a good stupid on our getaways. See you next time from your favorite device. Thank you.